So Alex, I, I was uh, reading your article in Rolling Stone recently uh, about Larry Pratt, mm. and I was really fascinated about that. A couple reasons. I mean, Pratt's just an interesting guy, and how he sticks around is sort of amazing. And also, it's sort of like redo, right? There was a whole, you know, in, in articles about him 20, 30 years ago and his extremism. How did you sort of pick him, and what was it like, and, you know, what did you find out in that article? Right. Well, the reason he sort of popped up on my radar was because he was getting all this press in the wake of uh, Manchin Toomey, the background check bill that went down to a lot of people's surprise. And he uh, was instrumental, according to a lot of observers, in that defeat. And he started getting a lot of press for this reason, including a profile in the New York Times. And this profile, as with other instances of him being on the various networks, seemed to think he was, you know, springing up out of the ground and didn't have this long multi-decade history of, of radicalism and extremism and I thought uh, it would be worth sort of reviewing that past and bringing it up to date. Do you think that New York Times article is a little overly generous about him? It was very generous. Yeah. I, I mean I just thought that that article sort of made him like you know a much bigger figure than I think he really is. That and it was also a complete whitewash yeah. of, his, of his radicalism. I mean this is a guy who's instrumental in the creation of the militia movement in the 90s who had you know, all sorts of connections to the neo-Nazi and the extreme right, you know, Pete Peters and the Christian identity movement, I mean, really scary individuals. And he was sort of acting as this bridge for many years and maybe still does for all we know between these groups and sort of the mainstream, mainstream gun lobby in, in D.C. And I think that's worth uh, remembering. I mean, I, I know that the Rolling, Rolling Stone, you know, earlier, many decades earlier, reported that he was actually at some of the early militia move meetings, and I think there's a famous meeting at Estes Park with the Aryan Nation. This was before Oklahoma City, right? Yeah. And he was there? Is that what they reported? Oh, yeah. He was one of the uh, select individuals invited. He was there at the founding meeting of the militia movement. And then wow. even after Oklahoma City, he was participating in these events, and he's made comments um, that actually seem to be kind of uh, rationalizing Timothy McVeigh, saying, you know, he was taking justice into his own hands because he felt that, you know, there was no uh, promise that that um, it was going to be administered in any other way. So some pretty, some pretty extreme um, views represented by this. Well, guy. Let's I want to know more about that. I mean, I'm really interested from your reporting. Like, how does he? How does the mainstream media sort of ignore all of that? You know, I'm many times asked to debate him, and sometimes I will. But a lot of times I'll say, Do you really know who you're dealing with? And people will be like, Oh, he's just a you know gun rights activist. Nothing wrong with him, um, but he has this, I guess your article is reporting that to other audiences, he's a very different person. How does that happen and what is that dichotomy about? I think a big part of it is just um, attention span and time and um, you know, historical memory is getting shorter and shorter. You've got these bookers and producers who are in their mid-twenties. They don't do a lot of research before they book a guest. They don't really know their history. And, um, there's not a lot that's been written recently for them to even look at. I mean, this Rolling Stone article you mentioned was published in 1995 right. by Leonard Zeskind. Yeah, and right, right. One of the reasons why I wanted to write this piece was to put something a little closer to now on the books so that people could reference and, and figure out who they're inviting on to CNN or NBC, MSNBC or any of these places. C-SPAN, he's on a lot. So what's he doing now? I know you said that, you know, while he's on C-SPAN one day, he could be talking to another audience about, you mentioned some of the Christian identity things. How does that, what's he talking about when, when the cameras really aren't on him? Well, when he goes on these smaller uh, right-wing radio shows, he'll drop bombs that he would never drop on C-SPAN. For right. talking about how African Americans need to learn lessons from happy Americans, talking about how um, representatives uh, in Congress who have been threatened by his members uh, should be lauded for standing up for constitutional principles, stuff that's gotten him in some hot water when it's come to light, but that he would never, he's smart enough to know no, these are not things you should be saying when you're on national television, but he goes on these little radio shows and um, he's much more honest about who he is. This whole incident with Representative Carolyn Maloney, where, uh, you know, where Pratt really got into it with her about this whole insurrectionist idea, I'm, I'm not surprised that Pratt does that, but the fact that he then came down and sort of doubled down on it and defended the whole thing publicly. How did that all come about? What was that? What was the core of that? What happened was one of Pratt's members in upstate New York, uh, who was in Carolyn Maloney's district, called her office several times and made um, threats against her for her support for gun violence prevention measures. And when asked about this, 
Pratt basically lauded this member of his, saying really? he was standing up for constitutional principles and that this is the whole idea of the Second Amendment was to put fear into the minds of government officials and he was very happy that this was in the back of her head, this fear. And this wasn't some abstract um, you know, notion he was talking about. A man threatened a woman's life and he was giggling about it in various interviews. So it, it was a remarkable moment in which this sort of insurrectionist idea was made real and you realize these guys are not joking. You know, Pratt, I think, you know, a lot of, and a lot of them think of them as strict constitutionalists, right? That's what they want to get back to the Constitution. I'm amazed that anybody who calls themselves a constitutionalist could think about threatening a dem democratically elected representative and, that's, and that that would be okay and that would be within the confines of the Constitution. I mean, I think one of the things that, you know, George Washington and some of our other founders abhorred was the idea that you know, arms, that arms could be used once a democratic government was established. It was one thing when you had a tyrannical king. Yeah. It was another thing when you had dem democratic elected officials. And one of the interesting things, of course, is Washington, you know, at, at times his soldiers actually wanted to revolt at certain times. And he said, I shudder at that notion, the idea that my army would be used against this Congress. Yeah. And so the idea that, that, um, that Pratt and others think that that's some kind of you know, historical justification just sort of boggles my mind. Right. But that's something I think that goes throughout the sort of, you know, the gun rights movement, right? This whole insurrectionist, you know, I, that there's yeah. an individual right take on tyranny. I mean, that, yeah. I've written about that, but it seems, you know, I wrote about that about five years ago, and, now, you know, now it seems like it's just swept this whole movement almost to, into a frenzy, especially with Obama in the White House. Yeah, absolutely. And when Pratt described Maloney and her fellow Democrats who support the same gun violence prevention measures, he described them as being in the tyrannical end of the spectrum. So for him, there's no difference between <laughs> King George <laughs> right. and uh, Carolyn Maloney, which is, I mean, the a historical um, nonsense is, is, you know, boundless with these guys. But maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, what's changed since you wrote your book and what inspired you to write uh, Guns, uh, Democracy, and the Insurrectionist Idea. Yeah, you know, I, wrote, I started writing that book in probably 2005 and 2006, and at that point, I was sort of struck by the, you know, we had the Timothy McVeigh incident in the, in the 1990s, and sort of that whole insurrectionist, I'm going to take on the government, sort of went deep underground. But what I started seeing in 05 and 06 was that, that the, the tendrils of, that, of those ideas were starting to pop up again. Mm. And what I wanted to do with my book is to do, be an early alert and a warning saying, you know, this is not just about um, self-defense. The Second Amendment now for the, for, for the gun rights movement is now taking on another meaning, which is an individual right to take on government tyranny. Um, and, you know, I wanted to sort of you know, be a warning alarm that this is really, that this is really, you know, going to be quite something. And of course, the book got published, uh, you know, right before, uh, actually right after Obama was elected. And at that point, the, you know, the movement had then sort of morphed into something that was, it was no more in the, you know, in my book, I document all the sort of the corners of the internet where this idea was coming from. By the time I, the book was published, it was, it was almost mainstream and you had the Heller decision coming out. Um, and then people were, you know, sort of looking at that Heller decision and mm -hmm. saying, is there an insurrectionist right in here or is not? And of course, Scalia, you know, as he did, as he didn't clarify a lot of things in that opinion, did, you know, really did say that there's, that there's, there, you know, there's some elements of fighting tyranny in here, which I think gave the right a lot of sort of comfort and they just ramped this thing right up. And now if you, you know, if you, if you look at that movement, it's all about, they, they say it very overtly, now even Wayne LaPierre saying these things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're here, you know, to be a check on government. If you think about it, um, you know, that's a really dangerous idea. The idea that individuals can decide Mm -hmm. when a lawmaker is being tyrannical. I mean, even when we go back to the forming of the, forming of the Constitution and the, and the Declaration of Independence, when the, when the I'll say the Patriots and militia members in, in Massachusetts decided they were going to declare independence, they didn't, you know, the first thing they did was correspond with other states mm -hmm. because they felt this was not an action we can take alone. But what the modern gun rights movement is not just even at state level can make these decisions, but at an individual level. And, you know, and I think you see, you see this played out in many ways. I think, you know, during the health care debate, you saw actually a lot of violence against congressional offices. Um, let's not forget that Gabby Giffords was actually, you know, she was shot. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people want to excuse Gerald Loeffner because he was 
because of he had some mental illness issues, and that's true. But I think what's not been reported adequately about Gerald Loeffner is he was also an adherent to right wing radio, and in some of his writings talked about this sort of tyrannical idea. So that I think is something that needs to be you know thought about a little clearly. And then and then I mean I think it's sort of the 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 sort of you know pinnacle of this is the Clive and Bundy situation where you have people you know federal marshals coming in saying you know this is not your land Mr. Bundy this is the people's land you need to get off it and Bundy sits there and says I think that's tyranny I'm going to have my militiamen fight you and what's really awful and I think this is the real scary part of this whole idea is that the federal government stood down now I understood they did that at the time try to spare some lives I, th I think that's what they were doing but they need to follow up because if you don't, who's to stop the next Clive and Bundy, right? I mean, the next guy who gets a, a, a child support order can say, you know what, I think I'm gonna arm up and let's see what happens. I mean, it's a really fundamentally dangerous idea. Um, you know, this, the origins of, this, of, the, of the Second Amendment, if you read them clearly, it's all about the militia. It's all about who has control of the militia. And many of the, you know, the southern states were concerned because their militia was very involved in putting down slave revolts. And they were worried that the federal government would take their militia and put it somewhere else. Uh, all the debate is about that. Now there's, the, you know, but this, this, this idea that there's an individual right to insurrection an individual right to change with democratic decided principles is, I think, one of the most dangerous and anti-democratic things we've seen in this country in a long time. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you mentioned Heller as institutionalizing or enshrining in the Constitution this insurrectionist idea, and there seems to be a schizophrenia within the gun rights movement. On the one hand, they're working through the court system uh, very effectively in some cases and continue to make that one of their main fronts of attack uh, at every level, and they obviously believe in the American judicial system. On the other hand, uh, they're still embracing this sort of uh, paranoid insurrectionist view, the idea that even if we have won these major landmark decisions that enshrine the Second Amendment as an individual right, we're still afraid that the government's not going to honor those decisions and going to come and take our guns anyway. How much is this about money? I mean, you know, Wayne LaPierre and the NRA execs make over a million dollars a year. Yeah. They have a giant direct mail campaign and their direct, I think their direct mail vendor actually is populates the NRA with most of the, most of the people at the NRA actually I think work or some of them work for this direct mail consultant Ackerman McQueen. Yeah. How much is this about money? How much are these groups gin this up because they know that they can make money on direct mail and things like that? Well, with the NRA, I mean, it's an industry group, so of course it's it's about money. With the smaller groups, I think you don't necessarily have to choose. I mean, Alan Gottlieb has made a pretty penny uh, off of right. <laughs> gun rights over the years. He actually has his own direct mail company, which dovetails quite ni nicely ah. with his um, with his uh, gun work. Um, guys like Larry Pratt, probably more true believers. I don't know how much he's made, but according to his tax forms, it's not it's not very much by um, by these standards. Um, but there's also a lot of, on the activist sort of grassroots side, just a lot of full-time volunteers who really do believe in, in this yeah. issue and aren't making any money. I mean, you go to some of these booths with these really small state-level groups, and they're, they're just volunteers. Um, and they'll talk your ear off about this stuff, and they have day jobs. And they're the ones who are really fueling a lot of these state-level fights. You know, Alex, I think a lot about what I do. I've been doing this for 25 years. And, you know, someday, hopefully I'll retire and do some other stuff. But, you know, what happens on the, on the gun rights side? I mean, where are they going to go with this? I mean, it looks like when you go to the Gun Rights Policy Center uh, conference, you, you, I mean, it's mostly old white guys, right? Yeah. Who's, who's going to fill Oh, the they're shoes? very aware of, of this, it, and it's a huge problem um, that's, you know, kind of mirrors the problem of the, the Republican Party's base. It's, it's dying. The old white guys are dying, and they're not being replaced by um, their grandkids. You, you talk to the industry side at the NRA convention on the floor and they'll tell you, we're making more triggers for arthritic fingers and right. kids are playing video games. They're just, the new generation is not into guns the way their, their grandparents and parents are. And the, the demographic drop off that's looming is a real serious problem for them in the next you know, 20, 30 years, absolutely. Um, that's why you're starting to see more diverse faces in the outreach, in the billboards, in the NRA news shows, in the magazines. That they realize that to survive, they need more women. They need more African Americans, Hispanic Americans, um, because you know otherwise it, the numbers just aren't going to be there to support the fight with the intensity that they're currently fighting it.
you know, just start with sort of one group, which is women. I've been doing this, as I mentioned, for a while. Going back 20 years, they, the NRA kept on pushing these stories. Oh, more and more women are, are shooting. If that was true, you know, yeah. it, you know we'd have half of the conference would be women. Yeah. But that just, you know, I think that's a recycled story that they like to push. But is there any sort of credence to the fact that they are pulling more women? Are they pulling more African Americans into their midst? Or is that just wishful thinking? It's anecdotal and I think at this point still very much aspirational but um, also uh, an aspiration that is increasingly urgent. And I think you're going to see more and more efforts reflecting that. You know, but if they have that aspiration, how can they have a guy like Ted Nugent? Well, that's, uh, that's why it reflects the same problem with the Republican Party. Their base is, and their future are, refl are very hard to uh, address at the same time. I, I just don't understand like, how they can keep a guy like Ted Nugent on their board who has called President Obama a subhuman mongrel and then expect to go out there and recruit African Americans. That's the problem. But at their conventions every year, Ted Nugent's their biggest draw. You've got capacity overflowing crowds cheering on his every word. And they have to continue to feed the people paying dues with one eye on the future. And it's not an enviable position. And so, you know, isn't that sort of the box they're in? I think about it. Like, so they need to, like, they need to scoop up all these, and, and more, maybe even more right-wing people to fill these seats and f make the money flow and to look like they're powerful. But is that going to eventually just backfire because, you know, they're alienating the next generation who, who you know, who, who sees, um, you know, the world in a much more multicultural way?